I got paired against another player uh, just as strong as Shirov. And this time I had black uh, once again. And the funny thing was that I was going to play the same opening that I just played in this game. And I was wondering, what is this guy going to do? He saw my game that I just played in the tournament. So he's probably thinking, okay, I don't want to lose the same way that Shirov did. That's for sure. But he did something that was very smart. And I think I'll show you what that is. It's okay, it won't take that long. This one was very fast. So once again, we have a Sicilian. And we just learned what the name of this opening was. The Taimanov, knight c6. And what happened uh, in this game is, well, he started off by playing this. So, so far we're following the exact same game. I was willing to copy my game, obviously, because I won. And in this position, the game we just looked at, white played bishop to e3. However, the uh, guy that I played, he decided to play g3. Now g3 is usually a move that you play when you really don't want to look at any theory. So if you don't like theory and you're white and you're playing against the Sicilian, uh, trust me, you can play g3 against every single variation. Whether it's the Nidorf, Schwenningen, whatever, um, any move a6, d6, knight f6, e6, knight c6, knight d7. If you're ever just, you know what, you don't know what's going on, just play g3. You can always play g3 in the Sicilian. So that's what my opponent did, because he saw what I just did to Shirov, and he said, well, that looks like, you know, he looks at his computer a lot, he prepared a very nice opening, and it worked very well. So he said, well, play g3, and now anything he looked at on the computer is probably not very useful, because g3, there's not much theory. So I think it's a good idea, if you're ever playing someone who is weaker than you, to play a move that they're not very familiar with. It might not be the best move, and believe me, that is not the best move. But it doesn't have to be the best move, because it's probably going to confuse me. And it didn't confuse me that much, but uh, it certainly didn't give me as much confidence, because I had all these ideas in some of the other main lines, like bishop to e3, bishop e2. These are all very normal moves. And when you see a normal move, you remember, okay, I studied that. I know exactly what I'm going to do. But when you see g3, suddenly you kind of have to make stuff up on your own. And if my opponent, who's 2700, is making stuff up, and me, who's 2450, is making stuff up, probably he should win the game. He's going to be a bit better at uh, playing just general chess than me. That's why he's high rated. So he plays this move. I play this, because I never want a knight to go to that square. He goes bishop here. I go knight here. He castles. Okay, after g3, we could all guess this is what white was going to do. And now I decided to take this. He took. And I brought my bishop out and attacked his queen at the same time, which is always nice. And here he had a little bit of a think. And there are a few moves you can play. You can put your queen here. You can, for some reason, put your queen here. I don't agree with this move. Or you could put your queen here. Or you could play bishop here. And this is actually one of the best moves, but another thing about playing the best move is that your opponent, me, is also going to expect the best move. So if he would have played this, I would have been a lot happier, even though it's the best move. So he played one of the worst moves. Now, it's not a terrible move, but it's not the best move. So he played queen d1, and there were a lot of maybe better moves at his disposal, but instead he chose a move that I've never seen before. And that worked really well, because... Because I had never seen it, I had to think a lot here. It was a brand new position for me. And I think just succeeding and getting me into a position that I didn't know was uh, already a pretty nice accomplishment for, for him. So after queen here, I played pawn up. I don't ever want him to play that move. And I want to start to get this bishop out. And I think playing like this is a little too crazy for the moment because 
Um, if I ever open that diagonal, I have to watch out for my rook on a8. So, d6, he played this move. We all know what he wants to do with that. He's not just being sneaky with his king, but he wants to maybe push his f-pawn, and now it's not pinned. So he moved his king uh, away. I played bishop here. He played pawn here. Now, it kind of looks like a weird move, but in a lot of lines, if he ever puts his queen on this square, I could maybe play something like bishop here or bishop here. I may be threatening to take his knight and then put my bishop there, and I would have a tactic where I win his rook on f1. So, smart guy that he is, he plays a4. So, he's way, he's way ahead of me, already stopping that idea. a4, I played bishop here, so my bishop went from here to there. I think that's a, a big improvement. He plays this move. And of course, when you see this, uh, you start to get very scared of a move like this, because with the queen facing your king, there's a lot of tactics there. I castle. It's about time I castle. I don't want to wait too long without castling. And now in this position, uh, my opponent made a move, which I guess is a little annoying. He brought his bishop out, and he's threatening to take me and double my pawns. Now, of course, I didn't want this to happen. Bishop takes knight, but... Um, there's not really a, let's say, a good way to make sure that doesn't happen. Does anyone have any suggestions? Someone wants to double your pawns in front of your king, you know that's a bad, uh, a bad thing for you. We would just basically not want a position like this, because our king is open and these pawns are a bit weak. So what would be a logical way to get out of that? Your opponent just played bishop g5. Yeah. Bishop d4. Bishop d4. So, number one way of getting out of pawn takes is to give another piece the possibility of capturing. So, if you play bishop d4 and you're protecting that, what if I attacked your uh, bishop, like let's say, I bring my rook over there. So I see what you're going to do, you want to take back the bishop, so I'm going to go here. So if you move away, then I'm going to take your knight again. So what if I attacked you now? Play rook d1. Yeah? It's just saying if bishop goes here, then f4, and remember that's why he put his king there, said he wanted to play f4. So at this point, we're almost just losing losing time, right? Getting chased around everywhere. So we wouldn't want to go that square, that's for sure. Anything else? Yeah? Queen b6. Queen b6? Let's say that I'm really, really stubborn and I want to keep attacking your bishop. Maybe queen here. These might not be the best moves, but they're probably the most annoying. You want to keep your bishop on this great square? I'm saying no. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to keep attacking you. What if queen to d3? Because if you ever go back to that square, I think it's basically clear by now that we're going to play f4. We can try to leave it here, but you know, if we play e5 to protect it, well, that's great. We protected our bishop, but now I'm going to take your knight, since if you play e5, you're going to block your own bishop. So if there's no way to keep it there, and we can't move to e5, well, we don't have that many options. So while bishop d4 is a move that I probably want to play, it's a good suggestion, back here, in my head, when I was playing this game, I looked at bishop d4, and I said, well, you know what he's going to do? He's going to play rook there. And if I give up my bishop for a knight, I'm really going to regret that. And remember, if I give up my bishop, I still have to deal with that threat. And the whole point of my question right now is, how do we make sure that's not a threat? Bishop takes knight. So bishop d4 is a good suggestion, but we're just going to get chased around. So careful not to put our pieces on squares where we, we can protect them as much as they can be attacked. Yeah, you got another, another move? Knight to d7. So we talked about the first way of dealing with this threat, which is to actually protect it another way. The other way of dealing with the threat is to actually just 100% get rid of the knight, and then there is no threat. So that's always a, an easy way to do things. So if we move the knight away, it doesn't really matter what white does, but 
question is, uh, where is this knight going to go next? Because anytime you move your knight away from good square, f6, you better have a, a good reason for doing that. Otherwise, you might just be losing time. Can this knight go anywhere, uh, I guess, anywhere good from, from d7? So if we had to decide what the best square for the knight was, I mean, f6 was looking really good. Is there a new square that we can go to that's a lot better than that, or should we be trying to go back to f6? H6 next move, and then go back. So you think f6 is the best square for the knight? We could be going to this square, but of course, white is going to be very happy to just play this move. If we ever go there, and once again, just kick our knight away. We could be going to this square, but white is going to kick our knight away again. So there's actually no where we can put our knight, except where our knight is. So that's why it's actually a very hard move to move your knight away, and then play h6, and then move your knight back. Because although that's a good idea, does everyone see how we're losing time there? You're wasting time putting your knight back, and then you're wasting time putting it back again. So although that's not a bad idea, maybe we can give up one move, when you're calculating, sometimes that doesn't look very good. Why am I giving away a move and then putting the knight back? So I decided to play a move that I didn't think was difficult to calculate. I put my queen here. So now I'm planning to take back, so that's me getting rid of the, the threat. And my next one is going to be h6, and once the bishop is gone, then I no, nothing to worry about. There's no bishop takes knight threat. Now, this move, okay, I immediately would consider this as an idea because my queen was just there, protecting that square. So I would say, all right, what's your big threat here? You know, if I take or something, the queen takes back, is that a scary position for me? Not really. Not really. We just traded a couple of center pawns, and I'm not that upset here. If you ever take my knight and double my pawns, I'm first going to always take with the queen Make sure that if you double my pawns, we're going to have the queens off the board, and it's a lot safer. So that was the first move I considered. And I didn't look at it for very long. I said, okay, there. I'm going to take it. He's going to take back. I'm okay with that. And maybe about 15 seconds later, he played this. And I said, okay, wait a minute. What did, what did I miss? What did I miss? Okay, so I started by just trading the bishops. Nothing wrong with that. Well, you know, there's not much to do here. I have to take that. So I could sit there thinking, what is he going to do? But no matter what, I have to take this pawn. That's clear. Now, he did not take that pawn back. Knight to e4. Knight to e4 is what he played. So, silly me, I was only considering he's going to take his pawn back. Why did I consider that? Because he just made a move that I captured, I only assumed he would capture back. It's a very one-dimensional way of thinking. If you think that way, you're going to miss all of your uh, opponent's strong in-between moves. Moves that get played in between something you expect. I was expecting only queen takes pawn, and therefore I was very surprised, as was suggested, by the move knight e4. And the sad part is, after knight e4, if I resigned here, it wouldn't look that weird. I think I was really considering to resign, and then I looked at my uh, score sheet, and it was only maybe move 14 or something. And I said, no, that's, that's too early. I have to play a few more moves just to look respectable. So I decided to play here, and we can naturally keep adding to the pressure by playing queen there, and this is a permanent pin. There's no way to get out of that. There's nothing to do. Why did I not play h6? Yeah. Knight takes, and of course, pawn takes. The bishop takes h6, and I wish that I had time for two moves to move my rook and then move my king, but because I only have time for one move, I will just be losing not this pawn, but also this rook. So I can't move the rook. And I must, uh, I must guard against queen check and mate. And what happens if I play here? That well, I could bring my queen to h5, but this rook is also just hanging, and white is 
completely winning. So his e5 move pretty much won in the game right there. There wasn't anything I could do after that. There wasn't anything I missed. Well, I missed e5, but after that, it's pretty rare that one mistake means game over. But in this case, I think it was true. Yeah? Did the computer say it was game over, or was it actually game over? Or was it Both. just like your instinct? All of those are true. The computer said game over, it was game over, and my instincts were right that it was game over. But I didn't resign because I didn't want to look that bad. So I played this move, he played uh, this move, then I did this. Now I have a very hard choice to make because probably no matter what I do, I'm just completely losing. And, okay, the rest of the game is actually not very um, important, but I'll show you what, what exactly happened. In here. Threatening all sorts of discovered checks. So I'm letting him do all the discovered checks to me, but um, I don't think any of them are exactly winning. And after this, now he's cutting my king off here as well. And in this position, I just resigned. After queen takes pawn, I decided to give up. Because, for sure, he's going to play something like queen check next move, followed by taking this pawn back. And remember, if we look at this position, white is up one pawn. My king somehow is being almost checkmated in the middle of the board, and I don't really have any counterplay. So there's no good things about my position, and I'm down a pawn. 